Welcome to the John Gets Games tutorial for Nightmare Cathedral. In this video, I'll be teaching you the rules to the game as it's being played, and I will be showing you the first couple of rounds, and then I'll fast forward and show some rounds in the middle of the game as well. Now, before I jump into that, I would like to ask that if you enjoy this video, that you please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. In addition to that, if you'd like to directly support the channel, then you can learn how to do that by going to patreon.com slash John Gets Games. There, you'll find a bunch of ways that you can get access to exclusive perks, like watching my opinions episode episodes where I talk about my subjective opinions about all of the games that I'm playing. You'll also gain access to some videos early and advertisement free. Now, the last thing I'd like to ask is if while you are watching this video, you see a turn where you think we should have done something differently, or maybe just some part of this game really jumps out to you, then please comment about it down below because I'd love to see that kind of feedback. All right, let's now jump into the game. Out here, we have the game fully set up and ready to play for our three different players. Now, before I start, I would like to ask that you please turn on the Klingon subtitles because I might make mistakes as I'm showing you the game, and those will let me put corrections on the screen where you should be able to see them, and I will also put corrections below this video in the top comment. The other thing I'd like to mention is that today I am filming with a prototype version of the game. That means the art, components, and potentially even some of the rules might be different in the final version, so you should keep that in mind while you're watching this video. Well, let's start things off with a brief overview of the game. In it, each player exists in this nightmarish dreamscape, and what we are trying to do is exist here while also wielding the power of our dreams in order to dominate various parts of this realm. Now, as we play through the game, a nightmarish cathedral will be built in the middle of the playing area. Once it is completely constructed, we will shift into the nightmare second stage of the game, where these nightmares will actually enter the fray, and then their powerful effects will allow various players to devour the followers of their opponents, as well as potentially themselves, in order to vie for points. Each time you play the game, you will use two nightmares, and you will select those from a wider variety, and each nightmare's effects will vary, so the combo that you have will definitely change how that game will play out. Now, on each player's turn, we will move our dreamer to a new action spot. We will then perform the action of that location, and then depending on where the other dreamers are, our opponents will either conform to the action we went with, or they will dissent against it. But either way, all players get to do something on all other players' turns. Now, each of these actions has an associated action card in front of us, and as we play through the game, we can actually upgrade these actions so that they become more powerful when we select those actions, as well as when we conform or dissent on those actions when other players select them. Also, on each player's turn, we're going to try to play out dream cards, which have specific conditions, and if we match those conditions, then we can play these out and get the points that are associated with them. Now, we will continue to play the game until we either complete three rounds or until a certain number of followers are devoured once this Nightmare Cathedral is fully built. And after that, we score up the points, and the player with the most points will be the winner. Now, this was obviously a very high-level overview of the game, and I'll explain in detail how all of this works while we are playing it. And on that note, we can now start playing the game. For this tutorial, we are going to control the green player, and now we're ready to start playing the game. Now let's begin by focusing up here, because as you can see, there is a track going around the outside of these different actions here. Now this is the turn tracker, which shows us which turn we are at. And after each player's turn, this is going to move on to the next one of these spots. Now, as you can see, every one of these spots has a player color next to it. And on the first spot, it shows a green token. That means we get to perform the first turn of the game, and we will be the primary player for it. Once our turn is done, this will shift over here, and then the blue player will go. After that, this will go here, and the red player will go, and once this goes all the way around once, we will slide this round tracker down, and once we complete three full rounds, the game will end, unless we've hit another end game condition, which I'll explain in detail later on. Now, I'm sure you've noticed there are symbols on top of each of these spots, and I'll explain why those are important very soon. Now, as you can see, we get to perform the first turn of the game, so let's now go for it. Now, as you can see, every player has one dreamer figure, and at the start of the game, we are all on the night action spaces. In this action area, there are five day spaces and three night spaces. And what we have to do is move our dreamer onto a day action space that is not adjacent to the night action space we started on. We chose to start over here. And as you can see, this is adjacent to both of those actions. So that means we are not allowed to go to either of these, but we can go to any of these instead. Now, I think we want to go over here, and this is associated with the maneuver action. So let's focus over here because this is our player area. Now, as I mentioned in the overview, we have one of these action cards for each one of the five day action options. 
And in this case, we chose Maneuver. Now, these cards tell us exactly what we will do for those actions, and we can actually upgrade these cards as the game goes on. During setup, each player gained one upgrade, and for us, we got the Fortify upgrade, so that means our Fortify action is a little bit better than it was at the start, and I'll explain how that works later on. So let's focus on this card, and as you can see, it's split into three different chunks. Now this top one is for the active player when they perform this action, and then Conform and Descent are for our opponents, and I'll talk about how those work rather soon. This means we can do this top part, or for any of the day actions, instead of doing what the card says, we can simply draw two development cards. We started the game with four of those cards, and I don't think we need to draw more, and I'll talk about them in more detail soon. So let's perform this action. It says we get to receive four movement points, and then we can perform a conversion in our shaper's area. Then we can resolve up to three conflicts. Now that is essentially three things happening, so let's start with the top. Now each MP lets us move one of our followers or our shaper to an adjacent spot. So let's focus back out on the board. Now there are a bunch of figures out here, and each player has a bunch of followers which look like this. We also have a single shaper which looks like that, and then there are a bunch of shadows which are neutral units that all players will be fighting against. Now as I said, we have up to 4 MP, and that means we can move a follower to an adjacent spot, or the shaper to an adjacent spot for each one of those. Well, we started the game with some units over here, so let's focus on the spot. Now, I do think we want to move our shaper, so let's go right over there, and that used one of our MP. And then for our second MP, let's move this follower over there. Now, for our third, we have a new restriction, because we can't actually move this follower out of that area, because you can't remove followers from spaces that have opposing units in them. So you can move in, but you can't move out, and that is where conflict is going to come into play, and we'll talk about that very soon. Now, at this point, we have two MP left, and I think let's move both of these up there. All right, we finished the first part of the maneuver, and then it says we can perform a conversion in our shaper's area. We can see the shaper is right over here, and the way a conversion works is we simply select an opposing unit, so that could be a shadow or one of our opponent's followers, and then we remove it and we put it back to the associated supply, and then we put one of our own followers down into that spot. So we've essentially converted that shadow into one of our followers. All right, the final thing that we get to do is resolve up to three conflicts. Now, the way this works is we can select up to three areas on the board that have more than one player's units in them. Now, that does include the shadows, and when we focus out, it looks like currently these are the only two areas that have multiple different players' units in them. If there was a situation like this, where the purple player and the blue player both had followers over there, we could actually instigate a conflict in this zone, even though we are not part of it. But of course, that is not currently the case. That means we could do a conflict here, or here, or both, because remember, we can trigger up to three conflicts. Now let's go ahead and start over here. Now we are fighting the neutral shadows, so the way this works is we can now choose cards from our hand, and then once we've selected all the cards, we will reveal them, and then we will reveal the top one of these conflict cards for the shadow, and then we'll see what actually happens with this combat. If we were fighting opponents instead, then each player would play cards from their hand into that conflict to see how it resolves. Now, I'll explain the details of player versus player conflict soon. For now, let's just talk about going against the shadows. Now, what we have to do is select cards, and we have to choose at least one, and we can play at most one card per follower that we have in an area, as well as per fort. Now, we can place these into various zones, and they can be stacked up on top, and no matter how many are stacked on top of each other, each of these is going to add one card into a conflict in that zone. You can never have more than one fort in a zone, so that means if it was like this, we could play three cards, but since this isn't here, we can only play two. Now, we started the game with four cards in our hand, although one of them we always have in our hand. It's called Basic Combat, and it always comes back into our hand, and that's good because, again, you must always select at least one card when you perform combat, and you'll always have this one available. In this case, I think let's select these two development cards. Now, during a conflict, all we care about is the bottom part of the card. You'll notice there is other stuff going on with these cards, and that's because these are multi-use, and I'll explain what the top parts can do for us later on. For now, though, we're just going to select these two and reveal it to our opponents, and now what we have to do is draw the top card from the conflict deck. So let's draw the top card and see what it says. Now the first thing to point out is that there are a couple of rows. This shows one shadow, that's two, and that is three. And this will dictate the effect based off of the number of shadows that are in this conflict. There will never be more than three shadows within one given area. And in this case, there is just one shadow over here. 
So we can look over here, and it looks like one defense icon is showing and one attack. Now down here, we can see we played one defense icon and one attack, and now we can resolve this simultaneously. The way this works is every defense will absorb one attack, and every attack that is not absorbed will eliminate one follower from the opposing forces. Damage can also eliminate levels of these forts at a 1 to 1 ratio, but you only deal damage to the forts once all followers of that player are removed, and again, I'll talk more about conflict between players later on. Well, we did one damage and the shadows absorbed it, and they did one damage and we absorbed it, so that means we don't actually remove any of these figures. This means we can now move on to the resolution step. The first thing we do for that is discard these cards, although the basic combat is always going to come back into our hand. And now we can check to see if we are victorious. As you can see, every conflict card has a victory and a defeat condition. And again, we only see these cards when we're fighting against the neutral shadows. And we now have to figure out if we won. In order to do that, we need to talk about a fundamental idea in this game, which is called dominating zones. Now, in order to win, we have to dominate this zone. And the way we calculate domination is we first check to see if there are any forts in this zone. If there is at least one fort, then the player who controls that fort dominates the zone no matter what other units are in it. Obviously in this case though, there is no fort, so now we have to count up the number of units that are in this area. Now units are defined as player followers and shadows, but not these shapers. This does not count towards dominance at all. So we can see that we have two units, and the shadow has one, and the player with a majority of units will dominate. If there is a tie, then in this case, no one would be dominating. And if there is ever a situation where there are no units, then the shadows by definition are dominating. Now in this case, we obviously have two to one, so that means we are successfully dominating this zone. That means we are victorious, and again, if we did not dominate this after we resolve this damage, then we would have been defeated. So we can read the text and perform what this says based off of the victory or defeat. Obviously in defeat, that would have been bad, we would have added two shadows to any single adjacent area. But for the victory, it says we may play one upgrade card or draw one card. So let's focus back over here, and we still have these three cards in our hand. Now the basic combat is just used in combat, but what we could do is play this upgrade if we want to, or we could draw a random development card and put that into our hand. Obviously we've lost a development card because we played it into combat, but as you can see we do have this card that says upgrade, and I think we should take this opportunity to do that. Now this says develop, so what that means is we can upgrade our develop action. We haven't even talked about this action just yet, but when we do this upgrade, we simply put it right on top, and that means when we do perform the develop action either as a primary action or conforming or dissenting, the effects will have potentially gotten better. At this point, there's one last thing for us to resolve, and that is retreating. Once a conflict is done, the losing player must retreat all of their units out of the space. In this case, the shadows were the losing player, and when you retreat, you have to go to a connected space that has either one or more of your presence in it, or you are dominating it, or it can be empty. So the shadow has to retreat, and we can see over here, they do not have presence, they are also not dominating it, and it is also not empty, so that is not a legal option. But over here, they are dominating it, and it does have their presence, so it matches either of those conditions. Now, as you can see, those are the only two options. If this was a four-player game, however, this blocking token wouldn't be there, and there would be an entire other space down here as a movement option. Of course, this is a three-player game, though, so we're not playing with that space. And now that the retreat is done, the conflict has been fully resolved. So let's come back to the action, and remember we can resolve up to three conflicts, and if there are conflict options, we must perform them. There's a conflict happening right up here. It is two of our followers versus one shadow. This means once again we can play two cards if we want to, although we only have these two cards left in our hand. Now the basic combat is one we will always have, but the other one is pretty good. It deals two damage. And as you can see, there's just one shadow over here. So I don't think it makes sense to commit this to this battle. Let's just go with one card, and then we can reveal the top conflict card, and we can see that that shadow is going to do one damage. If there were two shadows, it would do two damage, which would be a bigger problem for us. Now, in this case, we will do one damage, which eliminates this shadow, and we simply remove it from the board and put it back into the supply. But then that shadow also deals one damage to us. That means this follower is going to be removed, and it does not go back to our supply. Instead, it goes down into Limbo, which is the bottom right-hand corner of the board. Now, followers in Limbo can do some good things for us later on with the Ritual Track, and again, I'll explain how this works later on, so for now we can simply leave this follower over here in Limbo. 
Next up, we can check over here and see that nothing has to retreat. And then the final thing that we can do is resolve the victory condition because we were victorious. Again, that's because we dominate this area. Obviously, we have more followers than any of the opposing forces. Now, the victory condition for this says we can produce up to two followers in any area that is empty or under our control, and it's under our control if we dominate it. Now, whenever we produce followers, we simply take them from our supply over here or from Limbo, and we put it down into the appropriate location. Now, as long as we have followers in our supply, it does not make sense to remove any from Limbo because they can be helpful down here. So let's simply take two from our supply, and we could put them down into any of these four spots because, again, that card said it had to be a spot that we control or that's empty. Now, I think we actually want to go over here into this empty spot, so that means we now control this spot, and in fact, we control four different areas on the board. After that, the second conflict is done, and there would be a third conflict if there was an option for it, but it looks like that's not the case. So we've come to the end of our action, and before we move on with our turn, it's now time to talk about dream cards. Now, we have two of these in our hand, and these can be played whenever the associated text on them says. In this case, we have one that's called Battle, and it says it can be played anytime. We have to play this as soon as we win a battle against the Shadows, and the other card that we have says it happens at the end of any player's turn, and we can play this if we have at least nine followers on the map. Currently, we have six followers on the map, so this one isn't complete, but this battle one is because we just won a battle against the Shadows. Technically, we won two battles against the Shadows. Now, that means we can place this into our Dream discard pile. It is going to be worth two points to us at the end of the game, and you can see this cathedral icon right here. Well, if we were playing the advanced version of the game, then every time this symbol shows up on Dream cards that are played would be the moment that we would place new tokens down here in order to build out the cathedral in the middle of the map. For for today's tutorial, we are going to play with the standard mode, though, where the cathedral is going to be built out at the end of players' turns, and I'll explain how that works later on, so that means we can simply ignore this icon. But again, if you're playing with the advanced rules, the cathedral is only constructed when players are able to successfully play dream cards that have that icon on them. Fortunately, many of these dream cards do have that icon. Well, at this point in our turn, after we finish our action, we've now reached the dream step. Now, I said that these cards can be played whenever they specify, but at this point on every player's turn, they can now discard as many dream cards as they want to, and then they will draw back until they have two dream cards in their hand. So let's focus over here, and we currently have one card in our hand. So we could discard this if we want to, if we just don't think it's something that we'll realistically be able to do, and after we potentially do that, we'll draw up. We could, of course, just keep this and then draw one card. As you can see, there are three face-up dream cards out here, and if we took one of these, we would immediately replace it. So a new card would go out, and then we could potentially take that one if we wanted to. And we also could just draw blind from the top of the deck. Out of all these options, I think I actually like this one, which is associated with the Ritual Track. So let's put that in our hand, and I think we'll also keep this Dream Units one. Considering we have six units on the map, we just need three more, and that should hypothetically be something we can do relatively easily. We'll just have to see if we actually make that happen. After this, we have to, of course, immediately refill the market. And then the next thing that we have to do is check our development card hand limit. If we had more than eight cards in our hand right now, we would have to discard down until we had eight. And remember, this basic combat card counts as one of those. In this case, we only have two, so obviously we are fine. And at this moment, if anything triggered at the end of our turn, now would be the time that we did that. But the only thing that we have for that is this card right here. And again, we don't actually have enough followers on the board in order to trigger it. So let's now continue on with our turn. Now we are technically done with everything we are going to do as the primary player, but each of our opponents also can do something on our turn. We do this in player order going clockwise around the board, so that means the blue player now can either conform to the action that we chose or they could descend. So let's focus over here to talk about the difference between those two options. Now, in order to conform to an action, you have to have your dreamer be adjacent to the day action that was just triggered. As you can see, the day action is right over here, and that means the purple player is adjacent to it, so they could conform to it if they want to, but the blue player is not adjacent. That means conforming is not an option for them, and the only thing they can do is descent. It's worth noting that once the purple player goes, they could conform, or they could still descent from this if they feel like the descent and action is something they would prefer to do. Again, we do this in clockwise order, so blue gets to make this decision, but it isn't really a decision. They can't conform, so instead they'll perform the descent option. Now, when a player conforms or descents, they do this based off of the action that was triggered by the active player, and they do this whether or not the active player actually activated it. Remember, we could have just drawn two development cards instead of doing this, but our opponents would still use this icon for the conform or descent action. 
So Blue will look over here at their maneuver card, and where it says Descent, it says they get to draw one card. Well, that's pretty simple, they just draw one development card and add that to their hand. After that, the purple player can conform or descent because they are adjacent to the day action that was activated. So they will look at their maneuver card to make this decision. Again, you look at your own personal one, not the active players. That means if they had an upgraded maneuver, they would do the upgraded conform or descent option that is on it. Now we know how the descent works already, but the purple player could conform instead, and that would let them produce a total of two of their followers into areas under their control. Between these two options, they've decided they're definitely going to conform, so they will take up to two followers from their supply, and then place these into areas they control. Now when they do this, they are going to have to put one over here and one over there, and the reason for that is because they have hit their unit limit. The limit is listed on the fortify action. As you can see, it says unit limit 3. Now that is the standard limit for the game, and that means players are not allowed to have more than that number in a given space. Now there could be three units of the purple player, three shadows, three green, and three blue all in the same area, but no one unit group could have more than that limit. Because of that, Purple decided to split this Produce Conform action up, and they are now at their limit in both of the areas that they control. After all of our opponents have descended or conformed, it's now time to move our Dreamer from the Day action over to the associated Night spot. As you can see, every one of these Day actions has an arrow, and from Maneuver, that's going to send our Dreamer right over here, and there is no penalty or benefit for sharing a Night action with any other Dreamers. What this does mean is the next time we are the active player and we go to choose a day action, we won't be able to choose either one of these because they're adjacent to our night action. This means we will never be able to perform the same day action two turns in a row, and that means we'll have to choose one of these three options once it's our turn again, but it's going to be a little while until that happens. At this point, the final thing that we do is move the turn token clockwise, so we now put it right over there, and as you can see, this shows the blue player's token, so that means the blue player will now be the active player, and they must choose one of these three options. After considering it, they're going to go right here and perform the development action. When they focus on their development card, it says they can play up to two development cards from their hand, and a maximum of one of these can be an upgrade card. After that, they will draw one new card into their hand. So, they'll look at their hand, and the first card they want to play is indeed an upgrade. This is the upgrade for Maneuver, and that means they can cover up their other Maneuver card with it. Now let's focus over here and see how it's different. We obviously activated Maneuver on our first turn like this. That gives you four movement points, and then you can move your Shaper and then do one conversion, and then resolve three conflicts. For the Conform, you can produce up to two units, and then for Descent, you draw one card. When it comes to the Upgrade, we can see you get six movement points instead of four, the conform action is also different. This says you produce one into any area, not necessarily one you control, and then you draw a card. So you actually produce one less unit, but you're more flexible with where it goes, and drawing cards is a good thing. Finally, the descent action lets you draw two cards instead of one, so all in all, this is a pretty significant upgrade. Now their develop action lets them play up to two cards, only one could be an upgrade, and they have done the upgrade. And now the other card they are going to play is this ploy. As you can see, that says they can perform up to two conversions in a single area adjacent to their Shaper, and then they have to resolve one conflict. Their Shaper is right over here, and there are two adjacent spots. Now between these two, they've decided to target this area, and remember the conversion is going to convert one unit into their type. So they'll convert each of these shadows into their own follower type. After that, they do a conflict, but there's currently no conflict out here because that conversion completely turned this zone from a shadow-controlled area to their own control. Well, they've played two cards, and the final thing their action lets them do is draw one card, so they'll take that from the deck and add it to their hand. Now, they do have a couple of dream cards to consider, but currently they can't play either of these, and now it's time for their dream step. That means they can discard one or both of these and then draw back until they have two. After considering all of these, they are going to discard one of them, and then draw one from the top of the deck. After this, they don't have to discard any cards from their hand, because they don't have more than eight, and now it's time for the rest of us to go. This happens in clockwise order, so that means purple will go first. They are adjacent to the main action, so that means they can conform if they want. And if they did, they could play one development card from their hand, but it could not be an upgrade. If instead they dissented, they would simply draw one card. After looking at their hand, they do want to play a card, and it is going to be this ploy. That says they receive two movement points, and then they perform a conversion in their Shaper's area, and then they resolve one conflict. Now they could use this to move their followers or their Shaper, and if they want to use this conversion, they better move their Shaper. In this case, they are going to do that. They could go right over here with one move and then convert one of these, and then move a follower if they want. They could also go one, two, and then simply convert this into one of their own, and then not have any conflicts at all. 
At the moment, they've got a bunch of cards in their hand, so they think conflict might be a good idea. So yeah, they will move one space over here. Uh, they have one more movement point, and with that, they are going to move one of these out. After that, this Shaper will convert this into one of their own units, and then they resolve up to one conflict, and there is conflict over here. They have two of their units, and there is one shadow, and the two units means purple can play up to two cards from their hand. They have decided to play two cards. It's these. They have their basic combat and another one. Now that is three damage, so it seems they really want to make sure they eliminate that shadow. And now they can draw the top conflict card. There is one shadow, so that is going to do one damage. This means they probably way overcommitted here. Three damage is going to obviously not get absorbed at all. That will easily defeat this shadow, and then the shadow will do one damage back to them. That means one of their followers will go down to Limbo. This development card will go away, and the other one goes back into their hand, and they dominate this area, so they have been victorious. That means we actually have to look at this conflict card once again. The victory condition says they get to draw two cards. Well, that's pretty simple. They'll just take the top two development cards from the deck. All right, purple is done conforming to the blue player's development action, and that means it's now time for us to make our decision. We are also next to this action, so we can conform or dissent. And when we focus over here, we did upgrade the development action, so that means ours is more powerful. If we dissented, we would draw two cards instead of one, and if we conformed, we could play a card, not an upgrade, and that's actually the same between these two. So the main upgrade here was with the descent part. Now we only have two cards in our hand, so drawing two cards is somewhat attractive. Let's take a look at this effect though. That says we can move up to three of our followers from any single area to any marked area, and then resolve a conflict. Now we haven't talked about marked areas just yet, and I think this is a good time to explain it. Earlier in the tutorial, I noted that there are icons on the turn spots, and these have to do with marking. We can see right now we are in this turn, and it has that icon, and that means every space on the board with this icon next to it is a marked space. So let's focus back out on the board, and in this three-player game, there are four spaces for each one of the mark symbols. For the symbol we are currently in, it is these four spaces. And remember, this development card says we can move up to three of our followers from a single area to a marked space. Right now, we don't have three followers in an area, but we do have a couple that have two. So that means we could re simply remove them from one of our spaces and send them to a marked spot. When we look around, it looks like every single marked spot has multiple opposing units in them. If any of them had just one, then I think I'd be tempted to do this. But let's just hold on to it. I like the idea of potentially playing this into combat to get a couple of attacks, and I don't see this as an amazing moment to actually move. So let's go ahead and draw two cards into our hand, and then that's going to finish our Descent action. Well, blue is done, and their Dreamer will head right over here to a rather popular night spot. After that, we can move the turn token over here. That means this tombstone icon is going to be the marked icon for the round, and now the purple player has to take their action. They're over here, so they must choose one of these three options, and they've decided to go with a perform ritual action. So let's focus over here, and as you can see at the start of the game, they began with an upgrade on their perform ritual action. Let's take a look at the basic version before we see what they do with the upgrade. As you can see at the top, there's a few things going on. The first thing that it says is they can climb up on the ritual track. They can climb one step into a gray or blue spot before or after they spend followers to go up the track. We can see the next bullet point says they can spend their followers and units in limbo to climb up to the gray, blue, or red spots on the ritual track. Now effectively what this means is they can spend followers to do this as many times as they want, and then once per action they will get a free jump onto a gray or blue spot. With that in mind, let's focus down here on the ritual track. As you can see, every player has two tokens over here, and on every step of the track, they are either gray, blue, or red way over here at the right side. Now the main part of this action involves moving your token forward on this track, and then spending followers to pay for it. As you can see, there are these icons along the top, and you have to spend a follower from an area that matches that specific icon in order to do that. You could do this as many times as you want, of course, you'll just have to keep spending followers as that happens. As you can see, the first spot shows this tree icon, and the purple player has three of their followers on a space that has that icon. That means they could spend these to move to that spot, and before we actually see that happen, let's take a look once again at their upgrade card. Remember, this is what they're performing, and the only difference up here is the fact that they draw a card before they are able to get that free bump to a gray or blue spot, and before they can spend their followers to go up to the gray, blue, or red. So the upgrade essentially just gives them an extra card, whereas they would not have had this otherwise. Now let's see them actually start to go up those tracks, and they will start by spending two followers over here from the tree area. 
For each of these followers, they can move one of their tokens onto a spot that has that tree requirement. So this follower will move that token forward, and then that follower will move their other token forward. Now, as you can see, in order to move again, they need to remove followers from this symbol, or they could use their once per action free bump. So they could just do that without removing any followers, but they've decided they are going to remove followers for this. Now, before they do that, I do want to mention that these removed followers go directly back to your supply. Followers only go into limbo when they are lost during combat. Speaking of limbo, I did mention that followers over here can be useful, and that does have to do with going up this track. As you can see, you can spend three followers from limbo, putting them back into your main supply, and every time you do that, you get to go forward once on this ritual track. It does not matter what the icon requirements are when you do this. So as you can see, purple has one follower over here, so they can't do this, but if they got two more into limbo based off of suffering damage and conflict, they could then use all of these to get a ritual track bump. Well, as I mentioned before, they do need to remove followers from this icon to go up again, and they have a couple over here with that icon. They've decided to remove both of these to move both of their tokens forward. So they'll go like this. And now in order to move either of these tokens forward again, they need to spend a follower from each of these. So it is two followers to go onto the spot, one of each coming from these symbols. When we look back at the board, purple does have one follower with that symbol, but they also need to remove one from this symbol, and they don't have any over here. That means they don't have a way to actually do this, but remember, with this action, whether it's upgraded or not, they get one free bump up to gray or to blue, and they can do that before or after spending followers in order to go up the tracks normally. So they are done with this option, and now they will get that free bump going up to the blue spot, effectively saving them two followers they would have had to remove. So they'll move this token over here, and as you can see, on each one of the blue spots, there are action options. They get to perform this the moment they move a token onto this, and when there's a slash, that means they have to choose one or the other icon. Now this icon right here would let them control a nightmare, but the nightmares only come out onto the board once the second stage of the game has been triggered, and I'll explain how that works later on. For now though, the nightmares do not exist because the cathedral has not yet been built. This means their only option is that one, and that just gives them three movement points. These are optional, but they've decided to use two of them. They'll move this right over here, and then they'll move their shaper over there. They could move this one out as well if they wanted to, and if they did that, there would not be a conflict, because again, conflicts only happen when an action tells you to perform a conflict. In this case, though, they feel like it's probably better to have this follower hang out back over here. Well, at this point, Purple is done with the main action of the ritual, and as you can see, they got pretty far up here. That was five total steps they advanced. Now, I'm sure you're wondering why we're actually doing this. Now, part of it is the action bonuses that we get, but another part is victory points once the game is over. When we focus in, you'll see these victory point icons, and at the end of the game, you get points for how far these tokens have gone down. If this one was here and that one was there, this would be worth 7 points to them, and that one would be worth 3, so that would be 10 points right there. Victory point totals at the end of the game are generally not super high, and 10 points would be significant. So this is certainly something players are keeping in mind. Also, you have a unit cap out there on the board, so there is certainly something to be said for spending your units in order to gain advantages to then free up space to then produce more units into those spots. At this point, Purple is done with their actions, and they're going to keep their dream cards instead of discarding any to draw new ones. They are also good with their development card hand size, so now it's time for the rest of us to do something. We are next in clockwise order, and we are not adjacent to this action. That means we cannot conform, but we can descent. So let's focus on our card. Now, I'm bummed we can't do the conform action because that'd be pretty nice. Climbing one step onto a gray spot on the ritual track would essentially save us one follower we have to remove later on from a specific spot. We would absolutely do that if we could, but again, we are not next to that action. This means we have to descent, and we'll simply draw one development card and add that into our hand. And the same thing will happen for the blue player. All right, purple is now done with their turn, and we can slide this forward, and that means we are the active player once again. Now, for our turn, we have to choose one of these three options, because again, we cannot go to a spot that's adjacent to the night location where our dreamer currently is. So we have to choose one of these three options, and we did start the game with an upgraded fortify action, so I think let's go for that. Next up, let's focus over here and see how this works, although we are going to start by looking at the standard Fortify, and then I'll talk about the details of our upgrade very soon. Now, as you can see, the first thing it says we can do is spend one or three of our followers from anywhere on the map in order to build one or two fort levels in areas under our control. 
Now you don't have to put the fort down into the spot where you removed the followers, so we could remove these three like that, and then put two fort levels down over there if we wanted to. Now when we put the fort levels down, we either put the first one down into an area, or we stack them. As you can see, every player started with one fort on the board in one of the corners, and actually this one is special. It has this fortress token, and that essentially means that the bottommost token in this fort can never be removed, which also means players will always dominate that spot with their fortress, no matter what happens during the game. Now, each fort can never have more than three tokens on them, so if a spot is already maxed out at three, you cannot add a fourth. So that's how it works if we haven't upgraded our action, but now let's look at ours. We can see the upgrade says we could spend zero or two of our followers to build one or two fort levels in any area under our control. Normally it's one or three, and that definitely leaves us more flexible. This means we could spend no followers and simply place one of these down, but I figure while we are here we may as well spend some followers in order to place two fort levels down. In this case, I think let's spend this follower, and then let's go with one of these, and then we could place these down as a double stack, or we could split them up. And I think splitting them up makes a little more sense. Let's actually go like this and like that. Now, one reason we want forts is because anyone who has a fort in an area dominates it, and another reason is because when we do the summon action, forts are the main place where we will place new followers onto the board. Now, I'll explain the details of the summon action soon, and at this point, we've finished our action. Actually, before we move on, there's one more thing I'd like to mention about why we want to have forts on the board, and that has to do with endgame points. Once the game is over, every one of our two-level forts will get us one point, and every one of our three-level forts will get us two points. So, as you can see right now, we are getting no points for our forts, and this is certainly a reason to stack our forts up in order to get those endgame points, but the endgame is very far away from us right now, so I think spreading out makes a little bit more sense. At this point, we could now discard dream cards if we want. Now, this one wants us to have nine followers on the map, and we currently only have four, but with all of those forts, I feel like we should be in a position to do a strong summon action at some point in the near-ish future, so I think holding on to this is probably a good idea. This ritual track wants us to climb at least four steps on the ritual track in one turn. We did see the purple player went five steps on their turn, but even going four can be somewhat tricky, and I think let's go ahead and discard this, and then pick up this one, because this aligns a little bit better with what we're trying to do. That says at the end of any player's turn, if we have two or more level two forts, we can cash this in for two points at the end of the game. Currently, we don't have any level two forts, but we have three level one forts, so one more fortify action would let us make two if we wanted, so I think this one is relatively close. After that, we have to refill the spot with a new one. Ooh, and we could actually do that one right now. Of course, we don't have the option of taking it, but if this is still here on our next turn, we might discard one of these to take this. It's only one point, but it says that we need to have two upgrades, and we already have two upgrades. Next up, we can check our hand limit, and we don't have more than eight, so we're good. And now it's time for our opponents to go. Blue is next in clockwise order, and they are not adjacent to this, so they can't conform. Instead, they have to descend. When we look at their fortify, we can see the conform action would let them draw a card or play one upgrade, but of course they are not conforming, they are dissenting. Now this says they could spend two of their followers to build one fort level in an area under their control, or they could draw a card. Out of these options, Blue has decided they want to spend the two followers to build one fort level. They're going to spend these two right here, and then the fort level has to go into an area that they dominate, and they'll put it right over there. After this, purple is up, and they must descent. They are not adjacent to us in order to conform. Just like blue, that means they could draw a card or spend it to their followers to build a fort level. But at the moment, they only have two followers on the board, and they've decided they don't want to spend these two, so instead, they will just draw one card. Well, at this point, our turn is coming to an end, so we can move our Dreamer onto the associated night space. But now, before we actually complete our turn, it's now time to start constructing the Cathedral. The way this works in the standard game is at the end of each player's turn, we are going to place a new Cathedral piece down, but we don't do it on the first turn of each player. Obviously, all of us have performed one turn, and we are now finishing our second turn of the game, so that means at this point, we put one Cathedral piece down, and we will do this at the end of every player's turn until the Cathedral is fully constructed. Remember, this is the standard way to play. If you use the advanced rules, then you only place new pieces of the cathedral out every time someone plays a dream card that has that cathedral icon. So, at this point, we can take the next cathedral piece, which is this one right here, and we can now add it onto the cathedral that's getting constructed in the middle of the board. As you can see, this side is smooth on both edges, so it goes either there or there. 
After this, if there was an effect on the spot that we just removed a token from, everyone would gain that effect. In this case, though, this just means we only have the piece there in a three- or four-player game. We can look out here, though, and see several of these effects. Once we remove this, then every player will get to produce one follower in an area they control. When we remove this one, everyone will be able to move their shaper once. After that, this effect would let all of us move once into a gray spot on the ritual track. Then we have another produce action and another shaper action. After that, we have this one, which lets every player place one neutral shadow token into any area of their choice. After this, we all once again gain a free ritual track bump into the gray spot. And then after that, we get to this very momentous icon. When this piece is placed out, that will be the moment that we take all of the stage 2 cards and shuffle those into the respective decks. Now you may have noticed, on all of the Dream, Development, and Conflict cards we've been playing so far, there has been a stage 1 icon on the top. And when we hit that stage 2 icon on the Cathedral board, that will be the moment that we take all of the stage 2 development cards, and we shuffle these in with the deck of stage 1 development cards. And then we'll start to see stage 1 and stage 2 cards come into play, and these have more powerful effects overall. In addition to this, we will shuffle in stage 2 dream cards into the dream card deck, and we'll actually shuffle the market up in that moment, and then put out a new market that might have level 1 and 2 cards. And then finally, we actually remove the stage 1 conflict deck entirely, and replace it with a stage 2 conflict deck that we will use for the rest of the game. Now, once we have placed this down and do that action, the Cathedral won't be quite done yet. There's still two more pieces, and once the last piece is placed, that will be the moment that the Nightmares come out onto the board, and we flip this board over, and I'll explain how all of that works later on in the tutorial. Well, our turn is now completely over, so we can move the round track over, and we can see the blue player now gets to perform their turn. Now, they have these three options available to them because those are not adjacent to their night space, and they want to perform the first summon action of the game. So, let's focus over here, and they've actually upgraded their summon action, so we'll talk about that upgrade very soon. Let's start by looking at the basic version. Now, this says that each one of their forts are going to produce two of their followers, and then every marked area will produce one of the appropriate unit. Remember, marked areas are ones that have the icon of the current round, and this actually would produce shadows in areas where the shadows are dominant, and it will also produce units for their opponents if their opponents dominate any of the current marked area. Now, of course, the blue player is not performing this action. They're doing the upgraded version. It does everything we've seen so far, but then it has the added benefit of their shaper produces two of their followers wherever the shaper currently is. As I said, the first thing they do is produce up to two units in each area with a fort of theirs. So they can put two units over here, and then two units right over there. After that, every area with this marked icon will produce once. And this will actually be pretty great for us. Down here we can see that icon, so we get to produce once. We also have this one up here, so this is two units that we've made so far when it's not our turn. There's also that icon over there, so purple will produce once there. And then finally, that icon is down over here, and that means blue will produce yet again in this corner. Remember, all of us need to be within our unit limit. Although we actually have a better unit limit than our opponents. I didn't mention this before, but there is an added benefit for our Fortify upgrade listed down here. Our base unit limit is still 3, but then one area is allowed to go up to a unit limit of 4. So that one area can change as the game is going, and obviously at this moment we are not at the limit anywhere, but we can certainly keep that in mind as the game goes on. Finally, the blue player's last effect from the upgrade says they can produce two of their followers wherever their shaper is. Now, unfortunately for the blue player, their shaper is down here already, and this area is at their unit limit. So they are not able to fully maximize this summon action, but they were still able to put five units down, and even though they gave units to their opponents, they felt like this was the right thing to do. I do want to mention that if one of these marked areas was controlled by shadow figures, or if it was empty, then we would have produced one shadow into each of those areas. Blue is done with their action, and now they can discard dream cards if they want. They are going to do that in order to draw this dream card that we were eyeing. After that, we can reveal another one, and then the blue player is going to immediately play that dream card. Once again, it says they can play it any time, and in order to play this one, they have to have at least two upgrades, and they do indeed have two upgrades. So this is going to be one point for them at the end of the game. After that, they can check their hand limit, and they are not over eight development cards. And now it's time for the rest of us to go. Purple is adjacent to them, so they can conform or descent. The purple player currently has the starting summon card, and if they conform, then one of their forts can produce twice, while instead, if they descent, they can climb one gray step on the ritual track. 
Now, Purple is definitely tempted by that bonus down here because they could go even farther with their farthest forward ritual token, but at the same time, they only have three followers out on the board. If they conformed, they would produce two followers over here, which they could then potentially move over there, and they think right now it's probably better to get more followers out here instead of just pushing farther down on this ritual track. So they are going to conform and then produce two followers at their only fort. After that, we can make the same decision. So we could choose one of our forts to produce two followers, or we could climb up on the ritual track. And remember that in up to one area, we have a unit limit of four. With that in mind, I think let's conform so that we can produce twice at one of our forts. And I think I am tempted to just go over here. If we were to produce later on, then this would be full. But at the same time, we are currently next to the summon spot. So we cannot actually activate summon until we go somewhere else, like maneuver, which would let us move these out before potentially summoning. So I think we will utilize the fact that we can have a unit limit of up to four in one space. Well, everyone has now performed their actions, so now Blue can move their Dreamer over here, and at the end of their turn, it's time to put another piece of the Nightmare Cathedral out. That is going to go right here, and we have just uncovered that icon, which lets everybody produce one follower into an area they control. Technically, it's still the Blue player's turn, so they will place first. They will produce into this area. After that, Purple can produce, and they have to go here or there. They don't control this spot because they are tied with the shadows, and they don't control this spot because, remember, their Shaper doesn't have anything to do with control. They've decided to place into this spot, and then we can finish things off, and I think we'll produce right over here. All right, Blue is done with their turn, so now it's time for Purple to go. Now, they have to select one of these three options, and they've decided to maneuver. This means they gain four movement points, and then they can also perform a conversion in their Shaper's area before they then resolve up to three conflicts. So they'll start with their movement points. Now they're actually going to send two of their followers over here into this area. After that, they still have two movement points left. Now they don't want to move their Shaper, and they can't move this follower because they can't leave an area that has any opposing units in it. One thing they could do is move this follower into here, but it looks like they're planning on using their Shaper to convert one of the blue player's followers into their own, and that would put them at their unit limit of three. So instead, they're going to use their last two movement points to go here and there. Next up, their Shaper can convert one unit within its area, so that means they will convert this blue follower into a purple follower. After that, Purple now has three conflicts that they can perform, and it looks like there are two spaces on the board that are ready for conflict. They get to choose the order in which these happen, and they're going to start with doing a conflict right over here. Now, this is going to be between the Purple player and the Blue player. So, let's focus in over here, and as you can see, the Purple player has three followers, and Blue has two, but Blue is also the one who's in control of the region, because they have a fort. If there is a fort in a region, that establishes dominance for that player, no matter how many units are in there. For example, if it was like this, then Blue would still be in control of this region. Now, the way we do combat is the player who is not in control of the region in that combat first has to decide which and how many cards to play. Again, you can play one card per follower, so that means Purple can play up to three cards into this combat. After that, the player who controls the area can choose cards, and they can play one card per follower and one card per fort in that region. Remember, there can only ever be one fort, and it does not matter how many pieces are on top of it, you can only play one card for it. This means Purple can play up to three cards, and Blue can also play up to three cards, and Purple will have to choose the number of cards they want to play before the Blue player makes that decision. Now, I do want to point out that if there is a conflict between players in a region that no one controls, then the player who decided to start that conflict will be the one who decides who will be the first to play cards and who will be the second. Now, Purple has a whole bunch of cards in their hand, and they've decided to put three cards towards this combat. Now, Blue gets to decide, and they can also play up to three cards, and it looks like they have decided to do that. Now, these cards can be flipped over along with the cards that Purple decided to play, and it looks like Purple is doing one, two, three, four damage, and they have two defense to absorb damage. That three damage card right there is pretty effective. We can see up here the effect if they had played it as a development card would have let them move their Dreamer to any night space. So actually, if you use this, you can potentially activate the same action multiple times in a row, but it looks like they decided to use this for the damage. Over here, we can see the blue player played these three cards. That one blocks one damage, and it looks like they're doing four. So that is four damage coming in, and two is absorbed towards purple. So that means two damage make it through, and both of these will be defeated, and they'll be sent to limbo. At the same time, purple is doing four damage, and the blue player was only able to block one of that. 
This means three damage will be dealt to blue, and damage always hits followers before they hit forts. So the first damage will send this follower to limbo, and the second damage will send that follower to limbo. And then there is still one damage left to deal, and that is going to destroy this fort. Every fort piece can absorb up to one damage total, and in this case it looks like purple was able to wipe blue out entirely from this area. At this point, all of the non-basic attack cards will go to the discard pile. It looks like these all go, and then there is a basic combat over here, so that goes back to the blue player. After that, we now have to figure out who the victor is. Remember, that is going to be the player who controls this area, and if this had not been defeated, then blue would still control it. But obviously it was. We can see that purple is certainly in control of this area after the conflict, because they actually happen to be the only ones there. Remember, if they had a couple of followers and there were still opposing pieces from the player who was just fought, then these opposing pieces would have to retreat to an area that was empty or had presence for that player or that player dominated. Obviously, that is not the case, though, which means this conflict right here is coming to a close. Now, before anything else happens, Purple actually plays both of their dream cards. This one right here is called Battle, and it says it can be played at any time after winning a battle against an opponent. They just did that, so that is going to be worth two points to them. And then the other one is called Units. That says it can be activated at any time, and they have to have at least three followers in Limbo. Well, Purple has exactly three followers in Limbo at the moment, so they can complete this Dream card as well, and that is worth one point to them at the end of the game. Since they have three followers in Limbo, that also means they could discard all of these back to their own supply the next time they do a Ritual action in order to move either of their tokens up one space. Well, at this point, Purple has completed one of those conflicts, and there are still up to two to happen. Now, the only other spot that can have a conflict right now is this area right over here. There is one Shadow and one Purple Follower. That means Purple can only play one card, and they must play one card into this conflict. And after looking at their cards, they've decided to just go with their basic combat. This is not terribly strong for the situation, but it seems maybe they used all their good cards in this big conflict over here. Either way, we can now draw a conflict card for the shadows, and it looks like they are going to absorb one damage and then deal one damage, and that means that the shadows won't take any damage, but one damage will come back and send this purple follower into limbo. Well, that didn't go too great for purple, but I think the main focus of this turn was to take over this area. The basic combat will go back into the purple player's hand, and then the defeat effect for this conflict card will happen. That says that purple has to add up to three shadows into the conflict area. Well, that's right over here. There's already one shadow there, though, so they can only add up to two. After doing that, this area is at its unit limit for the shadow, but remember every single player and the shadows can have up to their unit limit within that one given area. Well, at this point, Purple has one more conflict to use, but it doesn't look like there's anywhere to do it, so that means their main action has come to a close. This means it's time for their dream step, and they don't have any dream cards, which means they have to draw up to two of them. Now, they can draw from any of these three here, and they're kind of wishing they had this one in their hand earlier in this round. That would give them two points if they initiate at least two battles within one turn, although they're not really complaining considering they did complete two dreams on this turn already. After considering it, they are going to take this one. That will give them one point at the end of any player's turn, where the purple player's shaper is within their opponent's fortress. Remember, the fortress is the fort that has this ring around it. Now, purple's shaper is just two spaces away from the blue player's fortress, so they figure this might be some relatively easy points for themselves. After that, a new one will be revealed immediately, and then they're just going to take a random one from the top of the deck. Next up, Purple does not have to discard any cards because they don't have more than eight, and now it's time for us to take our either dissenting or conforming action. We are adjacent to this action, so we can do either of those, which means we can produce a total of two followers into areas under our control, or we can draw one card. In this case, I think let's produce up to two followers, and let's place them right over there, and now we have a ton of followers out here on the board. Remember, one thing that we are trying to do is to have nine followers on the map at the end of any player's turn, and there are four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. That means we actually had nine on the board before we even did this, so we can certainly use this as purple ends their turn. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, though. It's now time for blue to descent. They cannot conform because they are not adjacent to this action. Descenting for blue is going to let them draw two cards because they did upgrade their maneuver. So they will draw two cards from the top of the deck. And now Purple's turn is coming to a close, and now is also the time for us to play this card. We can reveal it to all of our opponents, we can show that we have at least 9 of our followers on the map, and that is worth 1 point to us at the end of the game. 
Now, we don't actually draw a new dream card until the dream step of our next turn, so that means we're going to go into our next turn with just one dream card available to us. Now, there is one more thing to happen before we move on to the next turn, and that is that we have to add a new piece into the cathedral. That is going to be this corner piece right here. We can add it onto that spot, and then the effect over there says that every player can move their shaper once. We'll start with purple, and they're going to head right over here. It looks like they are going to try and get over here to the blue player's fortress in order to play that dream card that they just picked up. They do have to move the shaper over one more time, but that doesn't seem like a terribly hard thing for them to do. After that, we can move our shaper, and I think we'll go right over here. Being able to convert in this area could be pretty good for us, considering this is a spot that has that crescent moon, and removing followers from that type of area will become necessary pretty soon, at least as long as we want to actually move down this ritual track. As you can see, that moon symbol is on the second spot. Lastly, the blue player can move their shaper, and they'll move it right over here. Well, at this point, we can move on, and the next turn is going to be ours. Now, what we're actually going to do in this moment is fast forward through the game until the Nightmare Cathedral is fully completed. Remember, once we take this piece off right here, that is going to bring in the level 2 cards into the various decks. And once every single one of these pieces are placed out here, the Nightmares will enter the fray. So, let's fast forward until this cathedral is fully built. Well, there it is. The Nightmare Cathedral has just completed its construction. When this happens, there are two important things that are going to change to the overall gameplay. The first is that this board over here will be flipped over, and on the back side of this is where we are going to place devoured units. Now you may be wondering how units get devoured, and that can happen through development cards, conflict cards, as well as the nightmares that are now going to come into play. These are summoned by the completed cathedral, and each time you play the game, you will choose two different nightmares. You will then take their miniatures and place them right here next to the cathedral, and you will also take the cards for those. In this case, I printed these out because this is a prototype, and then the cards tell you the specifics of what those nightmares do. Now, these act a lot like shapers in that once they move onto spots, they are not constrained by other units, and they also do not affect control of regions, and these are effectively neutral units that players will have multiple ways to control, moving around the board and devouring tons of units. Now again, these start right over here, and the first time we move them, they go onto an adjacent area, and then they will not enter the cathedral space for the rest of the game. Well, I think this is a good time to look at the specifics of the nightmares that just entered play. This one right over here says that when you command it, you can then move that nightmare up to one space. Then you must devour up to three units in the current area, and if you devoured any followers, then you get to climb one gray or blue step on the ritual track. If you devoured any shadows, then you build one fort level for each of the shadows. So that means as we command this nightmare right here, we will also be able to go up on that ritual track, and as we devour these units, we put them over here onto this board. Now that is going to be our followers, and it will also be shadows that are devoured, and in general, things that become devoured are never removed from this board. Let's move on and see what the other nightmare does. It says when you command them, you move it exactly three times. You must devour one unit or place one of your followers per area you move through or stop on. If you devoured more units than you placed, then you must discard two cards. If you placed more units than you devoured, then you may draw one card. So this one gives you a bit of flexibility with how much you are devouring, and of course you might have to pay cards for that, or you might gain cards from this effect. Now I'm sure at this point you're wondering, how can we actually perform these command effects? Well, the level 2 cards are in the game, and if we look at our hand of development cards, we have one right here that will give us just such effect. This says we can devour one unit, which means we put it right over there, and then we can command one nightmare. Now, this has an alternate option. This says, or we may discard this card whenever we climb up on the ritual track, and if we do, this card counts as if we removed a follower from this specific symbol. So, as you can see, these level 2 developments are certainly different from the level 1 developments that we've seen, and there are other ways that we can command a nightmare. For example, it could show up on conflict cards. This is a level 2 conflict, and as a victory condition, it says one of your forts produces once, and then you can command one nightmare. Now, it's important to note you are never allowed to command the same nightmare more than once on a turn, but you might be able to command both of these nightmares within a turn, depending on the number of effects you get to activate. Remember, there are also options over here on the ritual track that give you the ability to command a nightmare when you move your token on top of it, as long, of course, as those nightmares are actually spawned on the board. 
Well, at this point, it's currently the purple player's turn, and they have decided to perform a ritual. The first thing they get to do is draw a card from the top of the deck, and remember, the vast majority of the cards in this deck are the level 2 developments since we shuffled those in. After that, they can now spend followers to climb up on the ritual track, and before or after they do that, they could get one free climb into a gray or blue spot. Well, let's focus out, and it looks like the first thing they're going to do is actually play one of these cards from their hand. It says they may discard this card when they are climbing up the ritual track in order to gain one of this symbol. They could have saved this to command a nightmare when they were playing cards, but they decided they wanted to use this right now. Now, they will use this to go up once right there and then they will spend this follower from that tree icon, and that will move them up again. It looks like they don't have any more of those icons on their cards, but what they do have is Limbo. They actually have five of their followers in Limbo, and they could spend three of these, sending these back over to their supply in order to advance once. They will do that in order to get right over here, and they're just one other follower in Limbo away from being able to do that again, but they're sure they'll do another ritual action before the game ends. At this point, they are done spending their followers, and they have not used their free bump up to gray or blue yet, so they will use that to go right here. Now this lets them either build one level of a fort, or they could command a nightmare, and that is definitely what they are going to do. After considering their options, they are going to command this nightmare right here. Now once again, that says they can move up to one space, and then they must devour up to three units from that space. Now if they devour any enemy followers, they can climb one gray or blue step on the ritual track, and if they devour any shadows, then they build one four level for each shadow. Now this might seem a little strange considering they gain a benefit for devouring their opponents but not themselves. The reason for that is because when the game is over, players will gain points for the devoured followers they have, and the more of your followers that are devoured, the more likely you are to get the most points. Now that's why this effect gives an incentive for the purple player to devour their opponent's units, because of course opposing units being in here is not a bad thing for those opponents. Now it is true that followers over here will stay there unless some special action removes them, and that means as we go deeper into the latter parts of the game, players will have less and less followers to actually put out onto the board and vie for spots in order to actually use them to go up the ritual track. So purple activates this nightmare and it must move one space, and they've decided to go right over here. Then it is going to devour up to three units on this location, and they've decided to have it devour one of ours, and then they'll have it devour two shadows. Once again, if they devoured at least one of their opponent's followers, then they get to go up one gray or blue spot on the ritual track, and then they also gain one fort for each shadow they devoured. Now, it's important to note these shadows are also going to make it harder for us to get points for our devoured followers at the end of the game, and I'll explain how that works soon. Now, this means purple will go up one spot on the ritual track, and they will gain two fort levels. They've decided to add a second fort level to each one of these and then they'll go up one step right here on that ritual track. So, as you can see, using these nightmares can give you really powerful effects. Just getting two fort levels alone was pretty huge for the purple player. Well, at this point, purple is done with that action, and now it's time for conforming or descending. Unfortunately for us, we cannot conform because we're too far away, but we can descend, and that will simply let us draw one card from the top of the deck, and this is a level two card. That would let us devour one shadow to produce two of our followers in an area adjacent to our shaper. So as you can see, sometimes you can devour units even when you're not controlling nightmares. Blue is next, and they are also going to descent, and that will let them draw one card. Well, at this point, purple is done with their turn, and now it's time for us to go. Now, as you can see, we have these three options available to us, and I think we also want to perform a ritual. Now, up to this point, we have not actually upgraded our Perform Ritual card just yet, so we will do a standard action. But before we actually do that, I'd like to show you the upgrade. It's in our hand, and in the future, I'm hoping to get this played out so that we can use it, because as you'll see, it is quite a bit more powerful. Now, this would let us climb one gray step on the Ritual track, and we do that first. Then we could spend our followers and units from Limbo as normal, and then after that, we can climb one gray or blue step on the Ritual track. Normally, we only get one bonus move, and this one essentially gives us 
an extra gray move. In addition to that, the conform here says we can devour one unit to climb one gray step on the ritual track and then produce two, which is quite a bit stronger than this one, which just lets us climb up one gray step on the ritual track. Also, the descent would let us draw two cards. So all in all, this is better. And you'll notice this is worth victory points. No matter if you cover these up with more as you go through the game, you'll always take all these out and score the points for the ones that you play. So this is an amazing card and certainly one we try to get played later on in the game. As it stands, however, we are going to perform this one, and let's start by using our free gray or blue advancement. This lets us go right up here, and then we can build a level fort, or we could command a nightmare, and I think we should certainly command a nightmare. In particular, let's command this one. Now that means we have to move that nightmare exactly three times, and every time we move, we have to either devour one unit from that space, or place one of our own followers into that area. Now we do have to keep in mind that if we devoured more units than we placed, we have to discard two cards from our hand, and if we placed more units than we devoured, then we'll draw one card. Now that nightmare is right over here, and we are going to use this to combo in order to do a better ritual. Right now, in order to move this token farther, we are going to hit a roadblock right here with that tree symbol. Currently, we don't have any of our followers on symbols like that on the board. And we also don't have any of that symbol on cards in our hand. And we only have two followers in Limbo. We would need three to advance on that space. So let's use this Nightmare to put one of our followers here so that we can then use that follower to advance this other one. Now that means we want to head in this direction. And I think we'll start by going right over here. When we land on this spot, we will devour ourselves because again, there is a lot of points to be made by having devoured units and we already have a fort over here. So maybe we could get a summon going in order to get some more units over there. Or maybe this will just go badly and the shadows might hurt our fort. But either way, I think we'll be a little bit self-centered right now and devour that unit. Now we have to move two more times. So we'll move here. And remember with this specific nightmare, every time we go into a new spot, we either devour or we can add a follower. Now we don't actually have a choice over over here, but even if there were things to devour, we could add a follower, and we are certainly going to add a follower right over there. Now we have to move one more time, and we will head over there, and then devour this follower right here. So we finished the three moves, and we devoured it twice, and only placed once. Now this means we have the penalty of having to discard two cards from our hand. So we can look at our hand, and we have a couple of these level 1 cards in our hand still, and I'm okay with getting rid of those. We already have a Fortify, and I think we could wait for a better maneuver upgrade. So we'll simply discard both of these and keep the rest of these in our hand for the future. Oh, we actually have an upgraded maneuver in our hand already. I didn't even see it. That is worth one point at the end of the game if we get it played, and this one would let us receive five movement points, and then we could command a Nightmare when we're doing a maneuver. Then we can perform up to two conversions within our Shaper's area and then resolve three conflicts. Uh, looking down here, the descent ability would let us also devour a unit to produce in a total of three areas under our control. That is a very powerful maneuver, especially when you compare it to the basic maneuver, which simply gives us four movement points and then lets us do one conversion. So we definitely want to get this one played at some point in the future as well, I think. All right, we finished controlling this nightmare, but we are far from done with our turn. Remember, we've only just used our one free bump up on this track, and now we can spend followers from these areas to continue to move up these tracks. Now what I want to do is command the other nightmare on this turn, and in order to do that, we'll have to get this token all the way over to here. Now I think we can do that, and the first thing that we have to do is get this gravestone symbol. Now we have one of those in our hand, we could spend this if we want to, but I kind of like the idea of holding on to this to play in the future with a development action to just take command of a nightmare in that moment. So instead, let's just spend this follower from right over here to do that. Next up, we can move here and then remove this follower. Oh no, and now we actually need to remove another one from this area, and I was planning on removing the one that we devoured in order to go to the next spot. I guess I got a little bit uh, caught up in the moment, so let's back up a little bit. When this nightmare entered this area, let's not devour a person, let's actually summon a person. If we did that, then instead of discarding two cards, we would actually draw one card. So if we just fix that real quick, we can put these back into our hand, pretend like there's nothing to see here, and we would have drawn this card, and we'd have that in our hand as well. Oh, this is an upgraded fortify. Now that would let us spend one, two, or three of our followers to build one, two, or three fort levels in an area that we control. The conform ability would let us devour a unit to play a card and draw a card. And the descent ability would let us draw a card and spend zero to one of our followers to build one or two fort levels in areas that we control. So that is certainly a powerful fort ability. And look at that, it's also worth one victory point if we are able to play it. 
So I've rewound things back to what I was planning on doing before I got a little devour crazy there. And now when we are at this situation, obviously we can spend this one to advance. Then we can spend this person right here in order to advance there. Now we have to use one of these moon symbols and we can spend that one to go there. And then we need a moon and a gravestone. And I know we're spending a whole bunch of people, but this is a big way to get points in the game. And I like controlling those nightmares. So we will spend this person and that person. And we now have almost no units on the map at all. As soon as we enter this spot, we can build a fort or command a nightmare. And remember, you can only command each nightmare once per turn. So we can't command this one, but we can command that one. Remember, that one has us move that specific nightmare once, and then we devour up to three times, and every shadow that we devour will get us one fort level. And then if we devour at least one opposing unit, we will get to go up once up to a gray or blue spot on the ritual track. That nightmare is right here, and I think I'm going to prioritize the forts instead of the ritual track. So let's go here, and it's just going to devour all three of these shadows. Now that means we get to build three fort levels. Now it looks like I've been overzealous. We only have these two spots to put down on after we removed so many of those units, but I think that's fine. Let's just keep it going forward. That is now a level three tower, and that is a level three tower, and we're not actually allowed to go up higher than level three, and we don't have a spot to put this. But remember, we could only move this one space, and I decided getting a couple of towers was better than going over here and devouring the blue player's units, which would kind of help them out over there, and more importantly, not get us a free tower. That would have let us advance on the ritual track, but either way, this is what we're going to go with. Well, at this point, I think we're done with a huge action for our turn, and I do want to point out these dream cards. We have one that's a level one that would get us two points if we were to control two areas adjacent to the cathedral, which we currently don't, and the other one is a level two dream card. It says units, and at the end of any player's turn, if we have three or more followers in at least four areas, this would get us three points, but it doesn't look like we're going to get anywhere near making this one happen anytime soon, and honestly, this one looks pretty hard to do as well. So I think let's discard both of these and then draw two more. There are three out here, and they all happen to be level two cards. This is units, and it says at the end of any player's turn, if we have at least six followers in areas neighboring the cathedral, we could get two points. This one is nightmares, and it says at the end of any player's turn, if we devour exactly three of our own followers in a single turn, we'll get two points. And then there is battle, and that says at any time, if we win two battles in a single turn, we get five points. Now, if I'm being honest, I don't think it's going to be easy to do any of these right now based off of our situation, considering we have essentially removed just about all of our followers from the board. So I think let's just go blind from the top. This one is battle, and it says at any time if we win a battle during our turn without taking a maneuver action, oh, that's interesting, then that would get us three points. And then the other one is nightmares. That says at any time if we devour at least four opposing followers in a single turn, then that will get us three points. Well, the next thing that we have to do is check our hand limit. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight cards. Remember, if we had more than eight, we'd have to discard down, but we have just barely enough, and we have got a whole bunch of awesome stuff in here, so I think it's very likely on our next turn, we'd probably go over here to develop in order to play these. Right now, our develop lets us play up to three cards, although only one of those can be an upgrade. Well, it's now time for our opponents to do stuff. Blue is over here, and they are not adjacent, so they can't conform, but they can do a descent. For them, that will simply let them draw a card. And then purple can conform if they want to. Their conform option says they could climb one gray step on the ritual track and then draw a card. They've decided that it's worth it. They'll go right up here. All right, that has finished up our turn. And at the end of our turn, we don't actually do anything with the cathedral because, of course, it is now fully built. Now, this will move, and I think we are now actually going to stop playing through the game. We've seen a significant amount of stuff happening already, and I think it's now time to talk about how the game ends. Now, there are two ways that the game can end. The first is if we keep playing until this token reaches the very bottom, then that will trigger the end of the game. And remember, this goes down every time that token reaches the starting point. So essentially, if we complete three full laps, then at that moment, everyone will have taken the same number of turns, and this will be here, and the game will come to an end. Now, there is one other way the game can end, and that has to do with the nightmares. You may have noticed down at the bottom of the cards, there are these numbers. Now, those are for the two, three, and four player games. And what you do is you find the higher of the two numbers for the player count. In this case, that is the middle number. So we have a 16 over here and a 15 over there. And then once there is that many or more units over here in the devoured area, then that will trigger the end of the game. When this happens, we keep playing until everyone has performed the same number of turns, and then we move into final scoring, even though we likely in that moment would not have completed three full laps around the track. 
So in this way, not only will the effects of the nightmares that you have each time you play the game change how the game goes, but the numbers at the bottom could also change just how long the overall game actually goes. So once we've reached the end of the game through either of those means, it will then be time for final scoring. Now at this moment we will gain points for a few different things, and the first of those is the ritual track. You can get a bunch of points from this track at the end of the game, and each one of your tokens will be worth points equal to the highest number that it crossed. If the game ended right now, purple would get four points. We would only be getting two points. If these went up here, then that would be six points right there, and blue has zero points on the track. But as you can see, it goes all the way up to 13 at the very end of the track. The next thing we gain points for are our forts. Every level 2 fort gives 1 point to that player, and every level 3 point gives 2 points. That means if the game was to end right now, blue would get 0 points for forts, purple would get 1 plus 1 or 2, and we would get 2 plus 2 or 4 points for our forts. We can easily see that on our cheat sheet right over here. The next thing we'll gain points for are our devoured units. What we do is we count up the number of units for each of the players as well as the shadows, and the player who has the most devoured units will get 8 points, second most will get 5, third most will get 3, and fourth most would get 2 points. If there happens to be a tie, then you sum up the tied places and divide by the number of players rounding down. After that, we can look at all of the upgrades that we have placed, and every one that has victory points on them will be worth points. This is obviously not worth any points, but other ones like this are worth points, and if you cover upgrades up that had points on them, then that's fine, you still dig through here and find all of the points and then score those. The final thing we score points for are our dream cards. Now this can potentially be the majority of the points that we get throughout the game, although that ritual track and those devoured units can also be worth quite a bit. If the game was to end right now, for example, we would have 7 points here in dream cards that we played. The purple player would have 4. And down here, the blue player has only played one of these dreams, so they only have one point in these dreams. Uh, overall, if we end the game right now, blue would not be faring too well, but they've got some pretty cool things up their sleeve, so they would potentially be able to turn things around before the actual game came to an end. Once we all add up points for all of these things, the player with the most points will be the winner. At this point, I've taught just about all of the rules to the game, so that's going to bring this tutorial to a close. I do want to ask that if, while you were watching this game, if you saw a turn where you think we really should have done something differently, or if just some part of this game really jumps out to you as interesting and you want to talk about it, then please comment about it down below because I'd love to see that kind of feedback, and I hope you enjoyed learning how to play Nightmare Cathedral. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including these producer-level Patreon supporters. If you too would like to directly support the channel in the creation of future videos like this one, then please go to jongetsgames.com support. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Thanks for watching.